Law of Attraction The two key phases of the underlying law guiding the resource in the domain of consequences are desire and expectation. The first mental attitude is the law's positive phase, and the second is the law's negative phase. Both indicate enticing lines of force that must be followed for best outcomes. The initial stage of desire encompasses a favorable process of attraction. That is, when someone fervently seeks something, a line of force connecting him to the intangible side of the desired good is established. If he loses strength or changes his desire, that particular line of force breaks off or misses its mark. Nevertheless, if he maintains his want or ambition for the necessary good, it will eventually be accomplished, in part or in full. The underlying idea is that one cannot covet something that already exists until it exists in form, at which point it exists in substance. Desire is the ability to make something visible or have a physical effect. Without expecting to receive it, in whole or in part, a desire is pointless. A wish or a dream without expectations is meaningless. Simply put, doing so wastes a great deal of mental energy. As a result, constant expectation is required for it to materialize in your life. Desire will connect you with the inner world of causes and allow you to invisibly connect with the substance of what you desire. Expectation is a force of mental design operating in the invisible domain, similar to the gravitational force in the physical world. Everyone is aware that many people aspire to nice things they will never own or will never put out the necessary effort to obtain. They get off to a good start and might even make it halfway before giving up. Most of their dreams or wishes will gradually come true after they learn to recognize the other half of the process at play and to expect what they want. Once more, we see folks who frequently expect the things they do not want to happen. This demonstrates how strong an attraction expectation is. Avoid wanting what you don't expect and refraining from expecting something you don't want. You attract the unfavorable when you expect something you don't want, and you merely waste precious mental energy when you desire what you don't expect. On the other side, your power to attract anything becomes compelling when you expect what you continuously crave. Expectation brings the desired thing into your life, while desire links you with it. The law is this. If you are suffering from any kind of oppression, including poverty, difficulty, limitations, or deprivation, start thinking about this law of mind right away. Over time, you will gradually become more adept at using it to create better things and circumstances. Your right to happiness is an unalienable one. In order to better understand the tremendous latent possibilities within ourselves and the unseen laws that the mind produces, we should endeavor to study more. Nature does not deprive us of anything nice or desirable. Rather, she has given us the mental capacity and inner strength to get and appreciate every good that is necessary for a happy and fruitful existence. The ability to apply knowledge is the true test of its usefulness, since knowledge that cannot be put to use practically is of little or no value. Here is a straightforward approach to using the law of attraction to our life in order to enhance the amount of good. Create an accurate mental picture of what you want. Wish for a tremendous deal of good in that direction, but don't specify how it will happen or what form it will take. Avoid being tense or experiencing any stress or worry. It is better to mentally recreate the scene at random times when you are relaxed and unhurried. Allow yourself to visualize the concept or project as if it were a moving image on a screen. Avoid pressing the concept because it will just lead to congestion and muddle. The outcomes will be better the more composed and silent you are. Maintaining this idea is crucial. Therefore, keep sating your hunger or want while maintaining a tranquil, assured trust that what you seek will manifest. As long as you maintain this attitude, the desired good will draw itself toward you. Depending on the clarity and force of the demand and the specific type of good requested, it may occur practically instantly in the case of simple items like an invitation, a book, or running into a buddy on the street, or it may come later. Be sensible and practical in the interim, and do what you can to encourage his arrival. I don't have much faith that the Lord will answer individuals who sit impatiently in a chair for their desired outcome to fall into their laps. It is written somewhere, Help yourself, 
and God will help you. Yes, taking action yields results. This supports the creative thought process and gives it a means of expression. The outcomes are then left up to the law. The law will be put to rest if you do your part. The length of time it appears to take to produce your resource will depend on how well or completely you cooperate with the legislation. Time is a construct of man. Nature has no concept of time and always acts in the here and now. Sometimes the outcomes you get will appear nearly supernatural. When there has been a profound desire for a certain benefit without anticipating its fulfillment, adding action will frequently lead to happier outcomes in the end. In actuality, when you combine the two fundamental components of desire and expectation, you are always in compliance with the law. A secret intelligence is activated, connecting you to the actual strategies for realizing your goals. The underlying principle of this attraction mechanism is as clear-cut and demonstrable as any mathematical science principle. We all use it on a daily basis in some capacity, albeit typically unintentionally and hence imperfectly, in order to avoid depriving someone else of something they are entitled to. Avoid wanting or demanding it. Only desire things that will make your life more complete, happier, and allow you to assist others in a better and happier state. Use the wisdom God has given you to distinguish between reasonable and irrational requests and try to be reasonable in your demands. Your innermost self yearns for abundance, satisfaction, and harmony. When you follow the rule, continually hope for a growth in good as proof of your faith, gain wisdom and trust in the great source of all good, you gradually come to possess these conditions more and more in your life. Everything that matches the condition of the mind at any given time is drawn to it like a magnet. Whatever you visualize in your head, anticipate and think about tends to attract things and circumstances that are harmonious with it. The law of mental attraction's reality and ongoing functioning have been amply supported by science. Everyone should therefore use extra caution in how and what they think. The earlier we acknowledge that most of what happens in our lives is a direct result of our predominant mental attitude, the sooner we may start to change and advance in our lives. To give the law a chance to assist us, we must endeavor to instill it with the will to advance. Then, everything functions to assist us. Obstacles will increase our resolve to prevail. Other people's discouragement will simply make things stronger and spark more activity. We will comprehend and see more clearly how every challenge is an opportunity for growth and every challenge is a step on the road to success. Because the spirit within us is unbreakable and is always summoned by desire and aspiration, it always has greater power and is richer in wisdom. Our so-called weights will lose their heaviness. This will direct our thoughts and deeds in the direction of the avenues that lead to the heights of achievement. The law of mental attraction functions similarly to the law of gravity. It is more precisely defined. Birds of a feather flock together, like attracts like, and things equal in the same way are equal to each other are common expressions of the law. People of the same pattern and kind are chosen for people by their ideas and actions. Since no two people think similar, and hence do not commit the same errors, it is challenging to pinpoint where someone fails to attract their wants. On the other hand, I outline and describe the three stages you can take to create a reality. You can learn what you don't do by closely observing the following recommendations. Interest is the first action that needs to be taken. Interest is what draws extra attention to a particular object or thing. Being worried about someone or something is undoubtedly involved. Interests have a tendency to visualize what already exists in the mind, in the physical world. Interests are things that are believed to bring happiness, pleasure, wisdom, and contentment. I recall a woman telling me that she always noticed handicapped people in a crowd before everyone else. They appeared to focus her attention on them and elicit pity from her. She had once been hurt and spent several months in a wheelchair. The recollection of the experience was still vivid in her mind and had sparked her interest. Due to the fact that no two people think similar, our interests are mostly unique. One person may be interested in something that another person would not be. Recently, my wife and I traveled to the desert to investigate the river's dried-up bed. 
She was particularly drawn to the glittering stones that are frequently discovered in this nation and include gold, silver, copper, and iron. I, for one, was searching for gourds that would naturally grow in damp areas. I was particularly interested in the type that the native Indians utilized for their ceremonial dances and employed in their hogans. Together, she was exploring the area in search of these unique stones while I was taking in the gourd-bearing vines. She probably didn't see many of the gourds, and I didn't even notice the stones. While strolling side by side, we were each looking in various directions because we had different goals in mind. We are blind to what is of little or no interest to us in life, and only see what most attracts us in it. This straightforward habit is where many of us can err. We can become so engrossed in things that are not prosperous, joyous, or healthy that we neglect the things we most want and that provide opportunities for our wealth and health. We fail to draw the bigger things that are all around us because our attention is so narrowly focused on the inferior things, either out of habit or ignorance. One day, a young man approached me and asked for advice on how to boost his income because he was dissatisfied with his meager earnings. He was an electrician, I found out. He spent several hours each day working. He enjoyed his home, garden, newspapers, and occasionally going out with friends. I informed him that I believed he would receive a good reward for his efforts. I continued by saying that he would have to pique his interests and achieve higher wages if he desired them. God gives the birds plenty of food and feeds them, but he does not give the birds worms to eat. At the very least, the bird must forage for food. Therefore, every one of us must do action in addition to wishing or praying. He made the decision to attend night school and trade newspapers for books and other resources because he wanted to improve his electrical skills. He developed an interest in radio and was excited about its potential. With the help of this desire, he was introduced to new people and landed a job with a developing radio company. He quickly tripled his little income and discovered a new pastime. Because he was unable to balance his interests and desires, only he is to blame for life's unhappiness. People find it so simple to allow themselves to go into a rut, and these ruts are always mental before they become physical. Those who are mindlessly and subconsciously going in the direction of misery and blindness. A really attractive person who had a condition that had caused her to give up and lose what she desired most came to me. This mother could be proud of her two lovely children, a lovely home, a husband who could support the family a large staff, and many servants. She wasn't happy, though, with all of this. She devoted all of her efforts to raising and raising her boys during their formative years. They were now married and constructing their own homes. Her husband was growing up and becoming a successful guy, which allowed him to go out to clubs and make new friends, both men and women, while she was stuck at home. He spent most of his weekends away because he was so busy pursuing his interests, he only returned home at night. She had a large house, staff, and a lot of money, but she was alone and lacked love and happiness. She was obliged to hunt for a way out after realizing that the split would get worse and that her husband would soon file for divorce. After a thorough investigation, I discovered that she was interested in art and literature, so I suggested that she travel overseas for the summer to experience new places and schedule a winter filled with new coursework. She felt refreshed and ready to start work when she returned. She joined a literary group and found it rewarding. She gradually took on a few minor dramatic roles before her passion in the profession turned into a strong desire to advance at some point. Home, servants, and loneliness all vanished along with the new goal. He quickly advanced in his radio profession and achieved great success. Her husband nearly felt envious of her attention. Her children were proud of her success, and she was really happy. You see, one needs to keep up a certain level of interest. To maintain one's appeal and satisfaction, one must keep their minds engaged. Our ideas should be guided by our highest interests, not by goods. Only through material possessions can we show our interests. A powerful idea or principle serves as the foundation of a magnetic force. Our interests are guided by this notion or principle, which in turn creates an attractive force inside of us.
If we talk about attractiveness, a young woman I must refer to as a friend is not very lovely, but she is quite appealing. She has a large group of close friends and is charming wherever she goes. When questioned once about what it was about her that seemed to have her admirers under her spell, she replied, I cannot give credit to my body nor to my brand of cosmetics, but I think it is because they like my frankness, my truth, and my pure mind. It is possible to cite countless instances of men and women who became famous and successful as a result of their love for and adherence to specific moral values. According to the law, good is always accomplished by upholding such a concept and carefully pursuing the will. Warning. Being extremely interested is not sufficient. This enthusiasm must be applied to our regular tasks. Our focus must reflect our interest, and the more seriously we take anything, the more intensely we will focus. The facts of the outside world are drawn by our curious attention as they take shape in our minds. As we focus on what interests us, our natural magnetism brings to us a lot of ideas that are comparable to our own. When a large portion of our interests are given our whole attention, we will discover that the majority of our small-minded and selfish inclinations are consumed by our higher interests, and we will make steady progress. When I was still a university student years ago, I recall frequently passing through the Williamsport station where a man had offices and was at the time a junior supervisor at the Pennsylvania Railroad. He frequented the premises even after hours and in the late hours, but I could see his office was lighted up and I could see he was actively working to complete some significant tasks. He appeared to be interested in his work, and he gave it all of his concentration in order to please his employer. Years later, I finally got to meet the man, and that's when I realized why he had always been given promotions to higher-level positions. He is now standing next to the largest railroad in the world's vice president. He gave everything he did his all and he didn't stop working on it until he was satisfied with the results. He told me that he wasn't shocked by the pay increase. He claimed, I just finished work, and the advancement came without my worrying about it. I believe that years ago, when he believed it to be unrealistic idealism, another young man put this law into practice. For whomever wishes to save his life will forfeit it, he remarked. Go two miles with whoever makes you walk a mile. Anyone who wants to be great must perform great service. Those who will get to the top must fall to the bottom. Those that go above and beyond without being compensated receive excellent pay. The person who is consumed by his own interests will eventually reach admirable accomplishments. Yes, you might respond, I know of guys who had similar privileges and opportunity to thrive, but they did not succeed as your buddy did. Emerson once observed, See how the mass of men worry about unmarked graves, while here and there is a great selfless soul who forgets himself in immortality. They had power, wealth, and intelligence, but for some reason they were unable to rise to the top. Even if they had every material and physical advantage that a typical man could need to attain the pinnacles of achievement, there was still something lacking in them. All success has a hidden source and cause that must first be given attention in theory before being given in practice. I want to say this. If you adhere to the idea of honesty, then do everything in your power to uphold it. Pay close attention to acting and thinking honestly at all times. If you ever have the chance to steal or defraud someone else, follow your moral code and don't let a seemingly little situation tempt you. At first, they always look insignificant, but this is actually only the beginning. Such dishonesty spreads like cancer. You rarely succeed in upholding your standards, but with time, you will be able to not only recognize, but also experience your own satisfaction. When you examine your connections carefully and the likelihood that each issue will adhere to your standards, you fill your mind with honesty, which acts as a magnet to draw sincere effort and long-term success. After then, adopt the truth and behave in accordance with it. Truth can be contested in so many different ways that you don't have to wait until next week or two to finish your assignment. It grows into something. After some time, you'll realize that you're so interested in and focused on the truth in all of its manifestations that you'll stop attracting dishonesty or deception to yourself or your company. 
When I first started doing this profession, I still recall what I heard. A store owner spoke about a small woman who frequently visited to purchase cards and presents for her family. The woman was asked whether she would bring out some cheap products for the little lady, but she responded, Oh no, she is too honest to be cheated. I didn't understand her point of view at the time, but I do now. When we earn what the little lady had earned, this may be said of all of us. When Mrs. Davidson was at the shelves one day, the head of a college in the East stopped by our chapel. He claimed to have read a few of the books on the display case and to have been particularly moved by Florence Shin's The Game of Life and How to Play It. He believed that the title was intriguing and appealing to everyone. You know, he added, I learned to look at life as a game, and I started out as a poor guy with some advantages, but I played. I didn't receive the assistance that these books can provide. I was successful, and now I teach thousands of young men and women how to play. Three guiding principles helped me succeed. Truthfulness, honesty, and sobriety. I used these standards to gauge my life, and I was delighted with the results. If you haven't already, establish a baseline or benchmark for yourself. Build on just one idea or object at a time. You'll cease paying as much attention to a less productive interest as you work to focus on a positive one. You don't need to put in the same amount of effort as certain folks. When people should alter their brains to be free thinkers and fear dishonesty, they act dishonestly. The law demands us to make the necessary corrections within ourselves, and if we do so, it will continue to act in our favor outside of ourselves. Because our thoughts are what pique our interest and focus our attention, let's work to avoid the causes and sources that draw the things we don't desire. Expectation Our final action is expectancy. This is attention in a proactive manner. It is intense concentration. It's comparable to how a cat would act if it were calmly waiting in front of a mouse hole. The cat believes he will finally catch the mouse, so he expects to obtain his prize at any moment. The cat's curiosity and attention would not be as intense as they are now if he does not believe and does not anticipate catching the mouse. He wouldn't be as active with his energies. You'll be most motivated to work on a project when you think it has a good chance of succeeding. With expectancy and expectation, this curiosity grows stronger. By doing this, you create the success you are striving for. Your curiosity and focus must be used to build your expectations. Elisha asked the widow what she had that she might sell for money when she came to him for assistance with a financial issue that would determine whether or not her two sons would live in freedom or slavery as a result of their father's debts. Elisha instructed the widow to take additional pots from her neighbors, go to her house, and there pour out the oil she had, because all she had was a pot of oil, which was something. When she filled the final pot after he had filled the others, the oil was completely gone. Not even a drop was left. When she reached the last jar and the conclusion of her expectation, he had completed the lesson's procedure, and the supply was gone. Only the amount of oil she had anticipated, measured by the quantity of jars she had gathered, had been delivered to her. Elisha had applied the law, but she had already decided how far her expectations would go. Although she may have wished for much more, she only received what she anticipated. You may have many desires if you are working towards success, good health, or happiness, but you will only be able to enjoy what you can expect. You might only get as much as you expect if you harbor doubts or fears in your heart that your needs will only be partially or imperfectly supplied. When you pray for something and then feel fear or doubt, it signifies that your mental forces are dispersed and you are drawing only the things that your less powerful thoughts think and expect. A renowned doctor was questioned about why he occasionally managed to resolve issues that others had been unable to. I never wait until a patient is in danger of not surviving, he declared. Sometimes these treatment suggestions are quite straightforward or outlandish, but eventually something inside me clicks and I accept and apply them. When he was certain about a patient's recovery, he claimed that he had never failed to assist them. We expect success when we have a strong mental connection to the notion that mistakes are impossible. Our belief fortifies our thinking, 
and the accepted principle acts like a magnet to bring anything we wish to us. Because to expect is to desire, and to desire is to attain.